Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to the Chair of Christian Thought 2023 Iwaza Lecture, uh, an evening with Josh Larson. My name is Carolyn Music. I am the Chair of Christian Thought at the University of Calgary in the Department of Classics and Religion. And as we begin this evening, located in the heart of Southern Alberta, we acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Pikani, the Kanai, and First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including Shiniki, Bears Paw, Good Stony First Nation, and the city of Calgary is also home to the Metis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I would like to say a few words about the role of the Chair of Christian Thought at the University of Calgary. The Chair of Christian Thought works with, uh, together with people of our city via different routes, the civic institutions, in institutions of higher education, and different Christian denominations. And these establishments are committed to bettering the city and its people through raising awareness of social matters, as well as supporting the cultural and artistic achievement and enrichment of our local communities. Therefore, I would like to thank my co-hosts this evening in the organization of tonight's event. Uh, uh, first of all, the Calgary Public Library, especially John McBurney, uh, the library experience facilitator, and Arvin, our tech man here at the library, who's been fantastic. And they warmly welcome all of us to this gorgeous building of learning and belonging. And thank you, Ambrose University, especially Monique Verhoof, whose role as, uh, at Ambrose as Vice President Student Life led her to the brilliant idea of suggesting tonight's speaker. Thanks are owed to the Chair of Christian Thought Advisory Board, made up of representatives from the Anglican Church of Canada, the Baptist Union of Western Canada, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, the Roman Catholic Church, the United Church of Canada, and the Christian Reformed Church of North America, as well as representatives on the advisory board who are also from the University of Calgary in the Dean's Office and the Department of Classics and Religion and students from the University of Calgary too. Your advice and guidance are greatly appreciated. So tonight uh, is the Awaza Lecture on Urban Theology and this annual memorial lecture is dedicated to Reverend Kazuo Awasa who served as Minister and of Church and Society at the Knox and Central United Churches in downtown Calgary from 1973 until his death in 1982. Human rights, social justice, and compassion were at the forefront of Reverend Owasa's ministry. He tirelessly contributed to welcome and drop-in centers, and his concern and activism for environmental protection was well before its time. Now let me turn uh, to tonight's speaker. I would like to introduce the presenter of this year's 2023 Iwaza Lecture, Josh Larson. And Josh, Josh is the co-host of the radio show and podcast Film Spotting aired on w, WBEZ, because we're in Canada, so I have to say Z, okay, in Chicago. He is the editor and senior producer for Think Christian, a website and podcast and video channel where Christians connect their pop culture fandom with their faith. Among his publications is his book, Movies Are Prayers. And Josh was a film critic for the Chicago-based Sun-Times media for more than 10 years. And since 2017, he has led Ebert Interruptus, a tradition established by the great, late great film critic, Roger Ebert, which analyzes single, a single film scene by scene over several days at the University of Colorado's Conference on World Affairs. That sounds fabulous. His most recent book, Fear Not, A Christian Appreciation of Horror, was published earlier this year. In Fear Not, Larson devotes each chapter to a different horror subgenre, connecting that subgenre to a commonly shared fear, 
Among other things, he considers how the Bible acknowledges and speaks to that fear and shows how some horror films can be viewed through a corresponding theological lens. Now, I don't want to say too much more about Fear Not because this is precisely what Josh will speak about tonight. So let me end this introduction with what Michael Phillips, Chicago Tribune film critic, said about Fear Not. In this book, quote, Josh Larson walks with zombies, exercises demons, sprints from Blair Witches to the Babadook to Jordan Peele. Um, Josh reframes um, every, uh, every kind of screen horror as a spiritual inquiry few of us have ever comp uh, contemplated. So please join me in welcoming Josh uh, to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'm grateful for the invitation to uh, be part of this series and, and offer this tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming out and giving some time. Do you want to see something scary? I think yeah. let's let's start with something scary, all right? Mrs. Bates. Now, why would you want to watch that? Specifically, why would you want to watch something like 1960s Psycho, which I assume a few of you already have. This is Alfred Hitchcock's classic, notorious horror movie. Um, it actually has an even scarier and more famous scene set in a motel shower. Uh, you've probably seen bits of that even if you haven't seen the entire film. But why do we want to watch horror movies? Uh, if you think about the genre, um, they're often grisly, often anxiety producing. They can be very exploitative. Those things are all true. So why do many of us return to this genre and watch something that would make us wince? I get that question a lot. I get that question from uh, friends, family members. They want to know why I'm watching those things. Maybe uh, you've gotten that question. Maybe you've asked that question of a friend or a family member. And I also get asked this question because I'm a Christian film critic. And surely, as a Christian, I shouldn't be spending my time on stuff like this. I've been asked this enough over the years that I thought, okay, this is a fruitful a fruitful query to explore. And that's what I did want to do with Fear Not, a Christian appreciation of horror movies. Kind of offer an answer of why are so many of us watching these things. So I'm going to jump off some of the ideas of the book here with you tonight. I want to make the case for horror to some of you skeptics out there. And I'm not saying that horror is for everyone. If you go away from this thinking, still not for me, totally fine, but if I do get one or two of you thinking about possibly dipping your toes in this territory, maybe between now and Halloween, checking out a horror movie or two, then I will consider this evening a success. So it's worth noting um, that before I was drawn to horror and became a fan of horror, I was deeply disturbed by it, and unfortunately, this was probably because I encountered it at way too young of an age. I found this is a common story for fans of horror. When you share what was the first horror movie you saw, when did you see it? For me, um, probably about, I don't know, maybe around five years old and a little, a little older, we had this family tradition of gathering at a relative's house every Sunday night. We called it Sunday night coffee. And this would generally be one of my grandmother's sisters. She had a number of sisters. They all lived nearby in the suburban Chicago area. And so after going to church in the morning and then church at night, I grew up in a two church services on Sunday family, we would get together at a family member's house. And this was a as you can tell, multi-generational event. 
tons of kids, tons of, of aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas. This was also late 70s and early 80s, so they weren't really paying attention to what we were doing as kids. It was a little different back then. Uh, so the adults would be talking, commiserating, eating, and the kids would be, you know, just told to stay out of their way. This meant often, sometimes, we'd find our way down to a basement, maybe there's a TV on, the older cousins took charge, and every once in a while, what was on TV? Well, maybe it was a horror movie. And this was TV, so it was edited. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the real deal, but I can tell you when you're younger like that and you come across something like Psycho, something like I also remember watching uh, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining in this scenario, it's still going to affect you. Believe me, it'll still affect you. So those experiences, you know, not so great, but also kind of tantalizing in a weird way. That seems to be another common experience for the people who have come around on horror. And then if you jump ahead five years from there, so maybe, I don't know, um, maybe a little more than five years. Let's say I'm a teenager at this point, and I'm really starting to get into movies. I mean, really starting to get into movies, not just going to see them on the weekend with friends, watching them as, me as many as I can, older movies as well as the newer movies, subscribing to multiple movie magazines, just devouring this stuff, reading critics like uh, Roger Ebert, who was mentioned at the time being a Chicagoan. He's writing for the Sun-Times um, and just devouring this stuff. And I began to pay attention to some of the creativity that goes into movies, wondering, now, why am I so engrossed by films and realizing, well, it's because there are filmmakers making particular choices, right? There are techniques being employed here. And lo and behold, horror movies evidenced a lot of those techniques. Horror movies can be great places to go to understand the craft of movie making. Now, that's not their reputation, right? I think the reputation is, well, horror is schlock, cheaply made, um, and you're not going to find any artistry there at all. That can be true. Definitely can be true. But there's also a ton of craft, especially by the extremely talented filmmakers who are working within this genre. So I started realizing this the more I was studying films and learning about films. And then I realized, oh, wow, something like The Shining, you know, that, that movie that messed me up when I was younger because I shouldn't have been watching it, is one of the supreme examples of horror as craft. I mean, it's made by a filmmaking master, as I said, Stanley Kubrick. Um, the Shining, I'm sure most of you know this, but based on the Stephen King novel. And it's about a five-year-old boy who is stuck in a deserted mountain hotel with his parents over the winter. His father, in the movie played by Jack Nicholson, is the caretaker. He's been hired as the caretaker for this winter. So the three of them stuck in this empty hotel. Things do not go well, just to say that. And I want to look at uh, one of the more fascinating sequences from The Shining. It's relatively tame, don't worry. Um, but this will help us talk a little bit about this idea of craft, okay? So this sequence is of Danny, the boy, all alone, and he's pedaling his big wheel through the halls of the Overlook Hotel. All right, those of you who have seen The Shining know we don't want to see what's in that room. So pause, we'll leave that there. Um, and you can go home and find out if you want to, if you don't know already on your own. Let's talk about the filmmaking craft here, though. Uh, this is what I want to get into. So these sequences of, of Danny, played by uh, Danny Lloyd, they're captured via the brilliant use of a Steadicam. And a Steadicam is this stabilizing apparatus for a movie camera that basically allows for these smooth, unbroken shots within a scene, shots that move actually through a scene. Now, the inventor of the Steadicam, Garrett Brown, he's actually operating the camera here in The Shining for these sequences. He's, he's sitting in a wheelchair, actually, is how they got these shots. And the effect, I feel, is just incredibly eerie in a number of ways, okay? It increases the anxiousness and the apprehension. We're already in that state because of the narrative, all right? But how does the filmmaking emphasize that? Well, we don't know what's gonna be around each corner and we know that corner is coming no matter what because of how the camera's moving. There are no edits, no cut or edit 
is going to save us from going around that corner. There's anxiousness there. There's anxiousness in the way an unbroken shot like this emphasizes the vastness and emptiness of the space. It's something we know in our heads, but here we feel it again because the shot is not broken up to different angles. We know that we just passed through a lobby that was empty. We're down a corridor that's empty. We're going into another corridor that's empty. This emptiness is all around us. Now, I also think that the music plays a part in this, absolutely. It gets increasingly uneasy, the music does. I think the stark lighting of those hotel fixtures are doing some work as well in putting us just a little bit on edge. Um, but for me, it's mostly the movement in this sequence. It's, it's sort of like Danny's not pedaling himself forward, but he's being pulled by some force out of his control. That's what's pulling him forward. And it's pulling the camera too, which means it's pulling us. And so all of that comes together, for me at least, to be this um, just incredibly uh, destabilizing scene in a movie that's full of a lot of them. Also, I've got to admit, part of the anxiety for me when I first saw this scene and when I first watched The Shining, again, I would have been probably, I don't know, 10, something like that, is uh, I was at age five, kind of the spitting image for young Danny Lloyd. I mean, I'm a little blonder here. I, I, apparently I went through a blonde phase, I forgot about that, but, but otherwise, not too far off. So I remember thinking when I was watching The Shining, a little bit like I was looking at a picture of my, my younger self. Didn't, didn't make me feel comfortable. I did come around though on horror, as I've said, and um, it really was because of that craft, you know? The shower sequence in Psycho that I referenced, another incredible example of filmmaking craft, the technique there, and there it is, the editing. The use of all those edits um, imply violence and stabbing, but if you look carefully at that scene, you'll realize that there isn't a single image of the slicing of flesh at all. It certainly feels like it, right? Um, but that's the effect that um, Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock and his editor created uh, in that sequence. All right, so hopefully I've made the case for you to think about horror movies as artistic exercises, not just schlock, but it's still leaving this question out there, okay, but again, as a Christian film critic, um, why are you bothering with this? Beyond the aesthetics and the craft, which a Christian film critic can still appreciate, but nevertheless, there must be something more, right? And so, yeah, that's the project of the book, the project of Fear Not, was to try to apply this theological lens to the genre. And my starting point, as, as the title of the book implies, is to consider really the idea of fear and how fear presents itself in the Bible. Um, that phrase, fear not, or do not be afraid in other translations, it's, it's one of the most frequently offered encouragements in the Bible. And maybe for some of you, instances are already coming to mind. Um, think of the prophets in the Old Testament telling the nation of Israel when uh, their darkest days may seem to be coming to fear not, to trust in the Lord, common message of the prophets. Um, often we hear some variation of fear not coming from the mouths of angels. So think of the angels at Christ's birth, delivering that to the quaking shepherds. Um, the angels announcing um, Christ's resurrection to his incredulous followers who had no idea what was going on, what this meant, telling them to fear not. Um, and of course, Jesus himself uses a variation on this phrase a number of times. I, I think about um, the story of him telling this to the father of a daughter who is on death's door. So we're told frequently in the Bible, uh, do not be afraid, fear not. Why is that? Why are we being told that? Well, for good reason, because if you look at the whole extent of scripture, we encounter a lot that we should be afraid of. There's a lot of terror in the Bible, and it doesn't take long to bust onto the scene. You can look at murder slashing into the narrative very early on, the fourth chapter of Genesis. This is where a Cain tricks and then murders his brother Abel. Um, and it's interesting that Abel here almost becomes something of a ghost. There's that phrase in Genesis 4.10 about the way his blood cries out. 
He's haunting scripture even further in the New Testament in Matthew 23 and Hebrews 11. Uh, There are eulogies mentioning Abel. So this haunting quality makes me think of a movie character like this murdered girl in The Sixth Sense. If you've seen that movie, if you remember her, um, she, like Abel, exists in some sense as an indictment on the guilty living. Think of another um, example of terror in the Bible. And this um, has to do with demons, common figures in horror stories, right? Demons are in the Bible too, of course. And I think one of the most terrifying examples of this is Jesus' encounter with the man named Legion um, because the phrase, very creepy phrase in Mark 5, we are many. That's the answer that is given, um, why this demon is named Legion. And this is probably the most famous possession movie, The Exorcist, in the horror genre. There's yet another variation coming out, I think, this weekend, uh, The Exorcist Believer. So this story has been with us a long time. Here in the original, it's little Regan McNeil. Um, Her tiny body in the film becomes this this sadistic tool um, in the claws of her, her possessor. I also think of that part in the story of Legion and Mark V, this other sentence that's pretty chilling. It says, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he, the man possessed by Legion, would cry out and cut himself with stones. Maybe, maybe there's something of the tormented howl of a figure like the Wolfman from 1941 here. This is the classic universal horror picture. So for many horror films, you can find not necessarily the source, but something of an equivalent in the Bible, uh, a story that is dealing in similar content, similar narratives. So what are we to do with the fears that are expressed on the screen and in scripture? Okay, and let's look at a couple of these fears we've already encountered here in these stories alone, both the biblical ones and the screen ones. There's fear of vengeance. There's fear of violence. There's um, fear of our faulty minds, of if we might, that might start to slip. What does that mean? What might that be like? Fear of a spiritual realm that we can't fully comprehend. These are all fears that show up in both places. Now, when they show up in the Bible, what does the Bible do with them? Scripture names them. I think this is a very interesting um, facet that was kind of a light bulb bulb that went off for me, is that Scripture is not dusting these things, sweeping them under the rug. Scripture is naming that these fears exist. Again, there are all sorts of stories of terror that can be found in the Bible. And I really think that's one of the reasons the Bible remains this vital document for so many people thousands of years on, is because it's not just trying to present a pretty picture for us. Um, There is definitely elements of that, and there's the great final hope of that. But the Bible also encompasses the entirety of the human, the entirety of human experience, okay? It, It captures the ghastly bits of human experience that come from our brokenness, from creation's brokenness. That's all in there. Now, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer recognized this. Um, And in fact, he preached um, a rather well-known sermon about this very topic. This is a 1933 sermon entitled Overcoming Fear. And here Bonhoeffer reflected on another scary story from Scripture, this one about the furious storm. This is in Matthew 8, the tempest that threatens to drown the disciples until Jesus comes and calms the storm. Here's what uh, Bonhoeffer wrote about this passage. Fear is somehow or other the arch enemy itself. It crouches in people's hearts. It hollows out their insides until their resistance and strength are spent and they suddenly break down. Fear secretly gnaws and eats away at all the ties that bind a person to God and to others. And when in a time of need that person reaches for those ties and clings to them, they break and the individual sinks back into himself or herself, helpless and despairing, while hell rejoices." Okay, that's really grim. It's very visceral, Um, but it's also true. We know to some extent, to varying extents, depending on our experiences, that this is true. This is true to life as a human being. 
And it's worth noting that these honest and really vulnerable observations, they're, they're coming from a man who faced historical world-shaking fears. Uh, Bonhoeffer, I'm sure many of you know, a German Lutheran pastor who opposed the Nazi regime. Ultimately, he was executed in a concentration camp. So Bonhoeffer, within that context and that setting, is speaking to a particular terrible fear. Um, but I think his sermon, if you read the whole thing, it also makes space for these more timeless and universal fears. There's a section where he talks about the fear of illness, for example. Um, and it, of course, can encompass just primal fears, our fears of things like a really scary storm, or how about something as simple as the dark? You know, these are real fears that we do experience. And like the Bible, Bonhoeffer doesn't deny these fears, okay? He doesn't say, let's just move past them. Jesus came out, calmed the storm. That's all we got to worry about, right? Jesus will take care of it. He does acknowledge them. That passage acknowledges them. Matthew 8 acknowledges the harrowing wind and the waves of that storm. For me, this suggests that the expression of fear is a more Christian response than the repression of one. And I don't know if that's our natural inclination, but I think if you look at the biblical models, the expression of fear is a more biblical response than the repression of it. I really think horror in the Bible is there to acknowledge that it's here. It's in our world as well. And if you're going to sweep that away, um, you're going to run you're going to run against the grain of scripture. So, let's bring this back to horror movies. In Fear Not, I um, began to think about these different fears that horror movies explored, and, and Carolyn touched on this in the introduction a little bit. Had to find a structure, a way, um, a way in to apply this general understanding of fear from a scriptural perspective to horror films. Um, and so it occurred to me that the various subgenres in horror, and horror has a ton of subgenres, so many I couldn't get to them all in the book. I had a word count from the publisher. I had to cut myself off at some point. Um, but it occurred to me that these subgenres tend to explore their own particular fears. So uh, slashers, and I would say Psycho is a slasher film at heart. Slashers explore one particular fear. Psychological horror films like The Shining, they explore a different fear. A ghost story like The Sixth Sense explores one fear and then a monster movie like The Wolfman, yet another. So that is how I organized Fear Not. I devoted each chapter to a different subgenre, then I did connect that subgenre to a commonly shared fear, went back to the Bible and explored how the Bible acknowledges that fear in some way, um, then back to the horror films and uh, looked at where we see that fear being explored in the films, sometimes, sometimes even answered, most horror films end horribly, but sometimes they're answered with a hint of hope. Um, in a way that does echo scripture. So, to break that down a little bit in detail, um, I want to ask your help. And I didn't mention this, Carolyn, but I know we have the mics to do it. So, those volunteers who are going to help with coming into the audience and um, just those people who raise their hands with the question I'm going to give you, um, if you want to go ahead and grab those mics, I know it's a little earlier than I said before, um, that would be great. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. It's going to be, what's the scariest movie you've ever seen? Okay. Um, feel free to raise your hand and just say a title, and that's fine. We can move on. Um, if you want to share a story about when you saw that movie, something like that, um, feel free to add a little bit of context all we really need, though, is um, a title from you, the scariest movie you've ever seen. We'll hit a couple people, and then I'll bring this back around to, to what we want to do tonight. I see a couple of hands already going up. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll start way at the top and work our way down. We've got a person top, middle, and bottom here, and maybe we'll just go back and forth, if you guys don't mind. So who is there at the top? Raise your hand again. Excellent. Thank you. Event Horizon. Oh. Event Horizon. Oh. <laughs> Someone was just saying they're going to watch that later tonight. Who's? Yeah. Okay. Love it. All right. Thank you. Event Horizon. Hereditary. Oh, that's a rough one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Japanese film called Noroi, The Curse. 
and it's pretty much Japanese Blair Witch project project. Oh, unfamiliar with it. How is did it come out after Blair Witch or before? Uh, after I think Blair Witch was 1999. Yeah, and this is 2005. Interesting. But way more terrifying experience for me. That's for sure. Oh man, more than Blair Witch. I don't. I don't know if I can take it then. All right, some people in the middle here. It's pretty recent, but I don't remember anything affecting me as much before than Skinnamarink. Yes. Skinnamarink came out this year in January. Just quick show of hands. I'm curious about the awareness of Skinnamarink. Anyone else? Oh, wow. You guys are good. That's got a very good chance of making my top 10 list this year. Um, all right. Got... Okay, go ahead in the middle there. Uh, when I was a kid, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yes. Saw it way too young. <laughs> yes. And uh, I remember not being able to go to sleep that night, just gripping the sides of my bed because I didn't want to get sucked into the mattress like Johnny Depp did. <laughs> that was the evil thing that movie did is you already aren't going to be able to sleep because you saw it. But the very idea behind the film is if you fall asleep, the killer will get you. So, oh, my goodness. I'm with you there. Let's go here in the front. I would say the 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre by Toby Hooper. The original. The original. Um, yeah. It was just so visceral, mm -hmm. and it was made on such a low budget that it felt so real. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, it was shocking for me. I didn't know that it existed, and I, I watched it one day thinking it would be just a typical slasher, and it mm. was anything but. Yeah. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, visceral is a great word to use for it. And I think the low budget nature there absolutely works with what the movie is trying to do, which is, to my mind, um, capturing the chaos of evil and um, the inability sometimes to even get our minds around it. So, yeah, right here in the front. Hi, I, I can't remember the title of the show, but it... It was a David Cronenberg movie where halfway through the guy pulled a gun out of his stomach. I believe that's Videodrome. Videodrome, yeah. yes. Okay. I, I walked out of it. I couldn't stand it. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Not for horror, not for everyone. I'm going to create that safe space for us. So, <laughs> yes, here. The most afraid I've ever been watching a movie was when I was a little girl and I saw The Ring. We were. Oh, um, wow. I was like, maybe 11 and we were at a cabin at a friend's house and they had the same mirror, like the old mirror what? In the cabin, and you have to go pee in the outhouse and there are the woods. And it was just as a little girl seeing the experience of that little girl and the hair. Was oh, someone was conducting terrifying. an experiment on you? This sounds <laughs> It was cruel. cruel. The, the adults put it on and everything. It was just <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you made it. Uh, another one, a couple here in the middle. Thank you guys for running back and forth. Um, Inception, the, the second movie. Which one was that? Inception. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. That one's for you too, huh? All right, thank you. And I think the next row had a few, yeah. Uh, I'm late to this, but when I was newly married, my friend and I watched The Strangers, and I just Ooh. sat at his house being very stressed that my wife was home with the door locked, mm. and making sure that she was safe because that made me very, very nervous. Yeah, a home invasion movie, which is a subgenre I didn't get into. Very disturbing, very disturbing subgenre. How about right next to in there? This is an embarrassing admission, uh, but Paranormal Activity 2, I saw at theaters, went home to my single bachelor pad at the time, a basement apartment. I had to turn my lights on that night. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Nothing to be embarrassed about. That's a horrifying movie and, and a great one, I would say. Had you seen the first one or did you? you Okay, so you knew what you were getting into a little bit. All right, over here. I've got a bit of a weird one. Uh, some of the Doctor Who episodes, specifically oh. thinking about the Weeping Angel one, which is when you look away, the statue of the Weeping Angel uncovers its eyes and comes closer to you. You look back and it suddenly moved toward you. I saw that one. It was one. brilliant. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're bringing it back to me. My daughter went through a Doctor Who phase, and um, I wanted to be supportive, but at some point I kind of let my wife take charge of that. <laughs> but I did see that episode when she was, yeah, that was that was creepy. Uh, over here. Um, I have to watch this film every year or so, The Babadook. Um, oh, yeah. It's one that every time I watch it uh, sends shivers up my spine. All right. I think that's... 
that's a great one that we can move to the next section unless someone has um, wants to share really quick. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, for me, the movie was Hush. That really scared me. Okay, yeah. I missed that one. That was relatively recent. Uh, it's newer, but it's, okay. uh, it follows the story of like a home invasion, but the woman mm. is deaf. So she can't hear oh, when the person's trying to come in. Oh, so that's that one scared me quite a bit. <laughs> there is a um, someone will show me up here. Isn't there an Audrey Hepburn movie Near Dark or uh, Wait, until Wait Until Dark, where she's blind, right? Yep. Yeah, that's that sounds similar. So okay, all right. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I wanted to do that because I'm just curious and I love hearing people share their stories of suffering. Um, but we've touched on a lot of different subgenres here. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street came up with slashers. Um, let's see, found footage came up with paranormal activity too. The Blair Witch Project is thought of as, um, you know, the pinnacle, I would say it is the pinnacle of that subgenre, but paranormal activity where this couple in the first one puts up video cameras all throughout their house to try to capture what's going on, what those sounds are in the middle of the night. Another great one, um, psychological horror, religious horror. I'm glad someone mentioned The Babadook um, because it is one of my favorites of recent years. Um, I do consider it a psychological horror film and it's from 2014. A, I'm not sure if it's New Zealand or Australia. I do believe the director, Jennifer Kent, is from New Zealand. Um, and it's all about, well, let me back up and say, Let's talk about psychological horror in general. Um, and this, I believe, this subgenre, again, I was trying to connect the fear that uh, each subgenre explores. I proposed explores our fear of our anxieties, a big umbrella term, right? But all of these mental anxieties that we face every day, everyone does, and we share some, they can be specific to who we are, our experiences, the Babadook, um, explores quite acutely the anxiety of being a parent, being what you think might be a bad parent, and being afraid of how bad of a parent you might become if pushed. Uh, it's a very delicate area, but also incredibly honest area for someone to explore. And again, Jennifer Kent is the writer-director here. Uh, the basic story is that uh, a single mom of a boy who's maybe six, maybe seven, um, they're bound together by trauma. This isn't a spoiler, it's in the opening of the movie, um, but we see a flashback where on the way to the hospital where she's gonna give birth to her boy, I believe named Noah, um, her husband is driving and they are in a car accident and the husband is killed. Um, she goes on to the hospital and does give birth to, to the boy. And this is many years later, but still this is a trauma that is weighing over them. And so she has that she's carrying, but she's just also stressed as a single parent would be, holding down a job, keeping it together. Um, Noah, I hope I have that game, name right, I'm gonna keep using it, but Noah has these night terrors, um, somewhat born of the trauma that he can still sense, even though he was obviously not born yet. Also sensing his mother's tension, a wild imagination this kid has and they come across a children's storybook about the Babadook, a monster um, who comes to visit you at night. And that kind of triggers things for him. And suddenly Noah becomes a really difficult kid to handle. Not necessarily dis disobedient, but again, night terrors, needy, crying, and the mother is just worn out. Um, her nerves are shreds. And I contend that the scariest image in this movie, moment in, the, in this movie for me, as a person who 2014, I would have had what, um, about a 10 year old and a 13, 14 year old. So I'd been through those younger years already. There's a shot of the mother laying on her bed. She hasn't slept at all because she's trying to tend to her son. The camera is right on her face. Uh, and in the background, we see him come into her bedroom. And she's just, she just needs five minutes. She just needs five minutes. We've seen from everything else in the movie, she's been trying to give him everything she can. And he starts whining about something. 
And the way Essie Davis, I believe, is the actress, what you see on her face is terrifying because you don't know what she's going to do. This could be a moment where she snaps. Um, and um, I've been there. <laughs> I've been there short on sleep, sick kids. You just need five minutes. And this is a horror film that's tapping into that deep anxiety um, in an incredibly effective way. It's also a horror film. I'm going to go long in the Babadook because we have time and I love it so much. It's also a horror film that's rare because I do think it offers hope on the other side. And I'm going to have to tread carefully here. Um, I don't want to spoil it because I want someone. I do think it's one if you're thinking about horror, you could dip your toe in. It's not graphic. It's not grisly. It does have its scary moments. It has some boo moments. Um, but I think you could dip your toe in the horror with this one. So I'm not going to spoil it. I'll just say that um, the way it ends, it ends with a demonstration of the radical extent of God's love, um, despite our fallibility, despite our failures, um, despite mistakes we've made, and the radical nature that God's love can extend through that. And it's not an entirely happy ending. There's a little postscript that's just brilliant about those anxieties are still around. Um, it's not just trying, it's not one of these horror movies that are the equivalent of, you know, putting an encouraging Bible verse on your refrigerator and believing that your mental health will just be solved, okay? It's, it's, it's more about the way that might linger in ways. Um, but because of the miracle of grace that's been extended, um, there's hope to get through it. Trying to be vague, watch The Babadook. Okay, sorry, went long. Uh, what else came up? Let's see, what's another, let me, let's let you guys pick. Of these on the screen, do you want me to talk a little bit about um, one of those four other than the psychological horror? So one you're particularly interested in? The Exorcist, okay, religious horror. Yeah, this is the one that's, you know, in a way, seems like it would be the most obvious and the easiest to write about from a Christian perspective. Um, and it was to some extent because the fear to me seemed obvious, um, that it's fear of um, a spiritual realm, just fear that a spiritual realm is, might be real. And depending whether you're a person of faith or not, this is still going to be scary, right? If you're a person of faith, um, it's a reminder that when the Apostle Paul talks about a dark power or dark powers of this world, that's a real thing, okay? Maybe, maybe we don't like to talk about it or think about it uh, as people of faith, don't get a lot of sermons on it, right? Um, but you watch something like The Exorcist or other religious horror films, and you have to contend with the fact that read the Bible, this sort of stuff maybe not exactly that, but the dark, a dark spiritual realm is a real thing. Then if you're on the other side, you're a skeptic, um, it's proposing, you know, well, maybe science doesn't know everything. Uh, maybe there might be something beyond the veil that I should think about and consider, and that's scary too. And The Exorcist is interesting because that's at the heart of that film, right? There's this young girl who's, um, you know, going through this just insane experience and all the doctors immediately want to find a medical explanation for it. And the first half of the film is these horrific tests she's made to go through so they can figure it out. And the interesting thing about The Exorcist is another skeptic is the priest who's called in to this case, right? He's also a man of science and he's one of the ones who it takes the longest to recognize, okay, there is something spiritual going on here. Um, and I have a bit of a complicated relationship with The Exorcist. This is often the movie people say is their favorite horror film. It's often the movie that Christians will say is their favorite horror film because of this religious notion. And for me, I'll just say, I do like it. I've come around on it. Every time I watch it, I appreciate it a little bit more. But I do sense a tension between um, this interest in that faith versus science conflict and the struggle of doubt that the main character is going in and the interest, this is one that does get grisly and it does get shocking. And the second half, to my mind, gives itself over to that in such a way that it flattens out that um, interesting internal debate that the movie is also interested in. 
that's just me. I'm probably wrong. Everyone else will tell you that I am. People love The Exorcist. That I would say, I'm going to leave tonight, give you each, give you a, uh, um, a recommendation, mild, medium, and spicy. That's a spicy one. So don't start there um, if you're interested in trying horror. Uh, just a couple of other religious horror films that I write about in the book, The Conjuring. Um, if any of you have seen The Conjuring from a mm, number of years ago now, but it's it's kind of a haunted house movie, but it's also very much about um, a spiritual realm being real and the family who lives in this house coming to, they're not a believing family, they're not a family of faith, like admitting that. And there's a great visual device in it. There's this creepy music box and um, the top opens and there's a creepy clown or something in it, of course. But what's interesting is there's a mirror in the back of the top and when characters look in the mirror, they'd see something that if they turned around, it wouldn't be there. Um, and I love that device um, because it's also connected to the fact that religious horror films are all about revelation. That's, that's the essential thing that they're interested in. So The Conjuring, The Witch, another very intense one I would put as religious horror. That hasn't come up yet. Um, the Exorcism, Exorcism of Emily Rose, Rosemary's Baby, I heard. Um, and so there's just a handful of others that uh, are worth checking out if you're at all interested. So I think, since you guys have seen so much horror, um, I think we might, this might be a good time to maybe turn it over to a more open Q&A. One, uh, one more thing I want to get to, and it's those recommendations However, um, and then we'll get uh, into that open Q&A. So I mentioned how I want to give you different levels. I think that's important. And this is actually an idea I'm very grateful um, for Think Christian. Um, we do a movie club, quarterly movie club online. People join and we're going to do um, horror for this month. And one of the people in the club said, you know, horror is kind of new to me. Um, what if you gave us an idea of, you know, a, a, a range of movies we could try before we get together and talk about them? You could, you know, give me a, a, a mild one or a medium one and then maybe a spicy one. So I was grateful to her for that suggestion. Um, so I'm going to do that for you tonight. Let's see. Some of these have come up, I think. So for mild, <laughs> I do think the Babadook would work, um, but it's pretty scary. I don't think 1941's The Wolfman is scary at all, <laughs> but I love it. I love it. And um, if you can open yourself up to the ideas behind it, um, some of it will strike you as silly, uh, maybe even some of the makeup and the costuming, uh, but the ideas are incredibly interesting, um, especially as a monster movie and what monster movies are. I contend they're about our fear of our own capacity for sin, okay? Um, but these universal horror pictures, the atmospherics are exquisite. The production design, the sets, um, the, the fog that's coming through these sets. I just could watch that stuff all day. So maybe for a mild suggestion, try The Wolfman from 1941. Medium, I'm guessing most people have seen this one. People don't tend to think of The Sixth Sense as a horror movie. It is a horror movie. Um, that Ghost of the Murdered Girl I showed before, that, her scenes are terrifying, I think. Um, and there are other incredibly scary moments in it. Um, but it's not in your face. It's not grisly. I think there is, there is a little gore in it. Um, but I do think it's a good medium point for considering horror and considering ghost stories. Um, and ghost stories, I contend, are all about exploring um, fear of guilt which is different than fear of our capacity for sin, right? Fear of guilt is about the things that have been done. So, medium suggestion there, the sixth sense. Here's my spicy one. Um, the Exorcist would count as well, but the Blair Witch Project, which has come up, this is the 1999 um, Sundance sensation, came out of nowhere and um, found footage genre, which is basically just pretending like, hey, what's on the screen? We just found this. We found these reels. We spliced them together. Um, we're going to watch it. We kind of put it in order. There's no explanation. There's no context. In this particular one, it's about the, mist, the footage that was found in the woods in Maryland left behind by three student filmmakers who went missing 
when they were out trying to make a documentary about a local legend about the Blair Witch. Um, it is not graphic either, but somehow one of the more unsettling, disturbing movies that I've seen. So I'm going to call that one spicy. So give each of these, if you pick one of these, give them a chance to scare you. Maybe not the Wolfman, but give the others a chance to scare you. That's crucial for horror. Don't go in, you know, arms crossed and let's see if you can scare me. They, they never work that way. So give these a chance to scare you and and maybe maybe they'll just connect with you on a deeper spiritual level too. So thank you for your participation and your time. Um, we're going to spend our next little bit together um, doing an open Q&A. So thank you very much.